So it's time for what my sewing and growing video for October and November. And I'll give you a quick look at December as well. And I'll just put up at the side of the screen the stuff that I've already sewn in August and September because the vast majority of what we're going to be eating in late autumn, winter and early spring has already been sewn. And that includes like most of the alliums, most of the brassicas, in fact all of the brassicas, quite a few of the salads, loads and loads of the spinach, um, and a lot of Asian greens, for example, and all of that sort of thing. So there's a lot in the ground growing already, and that's as it should be. So that is pretty much everything, I think, that I've got sewn to date. And I'll put a link to the database that I'm looking at on my iPad uh, down below so you can take a look. I'll put links specifically to um, the what well, I'm, so, well, I'm sewing in October and then a separate link for November, a separate link for December. And I'll just mention that the draft stuff is in sort of November and December because I haven't quite finalised my planning yet. I always I only really finalise about the day before what I'm going to sew for that month, but I have a rough outline of what I'm going to do uh, before then. Right, so let's take a look at October. Okay, so I normally like to sew my red onion sets and I'm sewing red winter this year. Uh, in sort of early November, sort of definitely late October, early November. I find that if you sow them any earlier than that, they almost always go to seed and they go to seed because they're too big in early spring and they think they're in their second year rather than their first year, although sets, technically speaking, are in the second year. Uh, but anyway, they go to seed. The later you sow them, you know, you wouldn't want to sow them much beyond early November, but the late is sown towards that early November date, the smaller they are in early spring, the less likely they are to go to seed. Now, weather conditions affect this quite a lot. So sometimes people will be wildly successful. So planting the sets now and in other years, everything will go to seed. You know, it is a bit weather dependent, but you're more likely to get them not going to seed later on. However, if you want red onions as early as you can possibly get them and you don't mind a few of them going to seed, that's my situation this year because my red onion harvest, main crop harvest this year was terrible. Um, then I'm going to sow just a few, a few weeks worth, really early. Well, not really early, but, you know, the beginning of October and get them in the ground as quickly as I can and growing strongly. They are very likely, because I'm going to put them in the polytunnel as well, to go to seed. I don't really care about that. So long as there's enough onion to eat, it doesn't matter that they've gone to seed. You can't keep them, but I don't want to keep them, I want to eat them. So anyway, that's what I'm doing with the red onions. A small batch at the beginning of October that's only going to last a few weeks, and then a bigger batch at the beginning of November, they're the ones I want to last for a few months until my main crop are ready. And so they're the ones I'll do a bit later. Okay, God, that was a long explanation. So, green garlic. We love green garlic, and so we'll start planting it out uh, sort of beginning of October. You can keep on going all the way through until sometime in November, sort of middle of November, that sort of time. But with green garlic, you want to get it going as quickly as you can, really, because you're going to harvest it green and you want it as big as possible in the kind of April, May period, because that's most likely when you run out of stored garlic and your uh, main crop garlic isn't ready. It won't be ready until sort of middle to late June. And so for that period, we find green garlic is fantastic. It's not a second class citizen by comparison with fully bulbed up um, garlic cloves. We like green garlic for its own sake. We think it's fantastic. And green garlic is just ordinary garlic, it's just harvested green when there's a mono bulb, not individual cloves, and the stem is in really good condition. And it's very similar to a garlicky sweet leek, in my opinion. So that's green garlic. We'll do a lot of it. We'll do the first batch. Uh, I think I'm only going to do something like 24 uh, cloves. 
and I'll just start those in modules in the conservatory just to get them going quickly. They're the ones we'll just eat for the first few weeks and then I'll do a bit slightly later crop um, in a few weeks time. And the reason I'm just doing it that way is because I've still got tomatoes in all the containers where I want to put the garlic, the green garlic. So just, you know, just a few weeks, just to let those potatoes, those potatoes, those tomatoes finish. Okay. Marathon uh, calabrese. You can grow all sorts of different types of calabrese at this time of year. I just happen to like marathon. It does pretty well for me all the time. And if you start it now and put it in small pots, you know, three, four inch pots or something like that in your polytunnel or your greenhouse, keep it reasonably well watered and then plant it out in sort of February time, then the benefit of that is that you're not tying up ground that you could be using to get a harvest between say November and February. And that's what I like to do because I like to put it in the ground where Asian greens have been, for example, or lettuce has been or spinach has been, because I won't need all those Asian greens, spinach and salads in sort of the middle of February when growth kicks up again. But I will need all that space through midwinter when grow growth is really slow. So I don't want to take up really large amounts of space with cauliflowers and calabrese and you know red cabbages and things like that because you know there's no point I can just have them in a little pot and just plant them out later. Like a lot of these things over winter there's always a little bit of a risk so don't get too attached to these crops you know they might fail you might find you get a little cold snap or whatever like even maybe a, a hot few hot days in the polytunnel it might trigger stress response in those cauliflowers or calabrese or cabbages or whatever and they might just want to seed really quickly so it's worth having a few successions of them and just not worrying too much treat them like a bonus crop and if by the time you get to sort of March looking nice and strong and healthy then leave them in and if not just pull them out and plant so, you know put something in that you sowed in February instead it's only going to give you an extra two or three weeks of harvest but for us, because we're self-sufficient, you know, it's really worth it. And it's just a fun game to play over winter, having these things growing. So that's the Calabrese. Same sort of story, I'm going to say now, for the cauliflowers. We're doing Orkney. It's a good one to overwinter again. But as I say, I just don't want to overwinter it in its final resting place. I just want to overwinter it in a pot. You could do it in a cold frame and transplant it in February. And I generally, what I generally do is, uh, because I'm starting to get like too much spinach, for example, in sort of the mid to late February sort of time, I'll just harvest every other plant and then I'll interplant into those gaps with, uh, maybe I'll harvest every, other th every third plant, interplant into those gaps with cauliflowers, cabbages, um, calabrese and things like that. Then I'll let the spinach grow on for a few weeks and then I'll harvest every other plant again. And then finally, you know, once the calibre is quite big or the cauliflower is quite big, I'll harvest the last of the spinach. So that's sort of the way that I do it. And by then, of course, we'll have masses of spinach because growth will be three or four times what it is over winter. Uh, you just don't need as much. Brussels sprouts. This is just one of my favourite tricks. And obviously, if you're regular listeners on my video, skip ahead on this bit because you'll have heard it so many times. But I think Brussels sprouts are one of the best brassicas to be eating in the hungry gap, sort of late spring, um, probably about sort of the beginning of May sort of time through to about the end of July sometimes. So for that period, you get this continuous harvest of the Brussels sprout plants. You start off getting Brussels sprout leaves. That's the first thing you get. Don't take too many of them, just a, one or two off each plant. Um, and then you'll get uh, the sprout top starts to form and that probably start about the beginning of July. Obviously this is way earlier than a normal sowing of Brussels sprouts would be. Take that Brussels sprout top off and eat it like a little cabbage. And that removal of the sprout top will trigger the development of the sprouts on the stems. But because they're growing in July, they will be huge. So the sprouts might be this sort of size, like again, a little cabbage. And so it's absolutely fantastic, really productive crop, takes almost no space up. 
and I've got a video all about it in the individual growing guide for Brussels sprouts. So take a look at that if you want. All the links and everything are down below. Whew. Right, aquadulce uh, board beans. So we do lots of successions of board beans because we much prefer eating them fresh. I know people say board beans freeze really well, but not to my palate. You know, I, I think they're just fantastic, nice, sweet and young. Uh, and they just degrade the bigger they get and they degrade even more if they're frozen. So we just like multiple successions of broad beans over sort of two or three months. And the first succession is the one we do in the polytunnel. I start them in modules just because I don't want to take up polytunnel space early on. And I'm only going to do 12. And that's enough, you know, just a couple of big pots, sort of 35 to 50 litre pots in the polytunnel, put them around the edge. Put a few canes in to support them because they will grow really big because there's not much light that triggers the plants to grow tall uh, and they grow in the polytunnel lots of people think oh what are going to do about pollinators because we know pollinators when they're flowering in sort of april time uh don't worry about it <laughs> they're just self-fertile and uh, we've never had a problem with a great crop uh, without pollinators but if you're really worried about it just kind of sweep your hand over the plants so uh, you're just kind of ruffling them a little bit and do that every few days. And uh, that's uh, insurance. So then we'll do another, maybe on the same day actually, another batch of broad beans, but these won't go in the polytunnel. They'll go outside and it's early enough for them to get fairly well established, but they will need supporting with canes because they're gonna be reasonably big plants, you know, like one or two, foot high over winter they will get really badly bashed up if you don't put canes in but because we're not doing many of them i'm probably going to do 18 that's not very many that um that's not a big job to put canes in for those and uh you know little successions like that very manageable but you still get a great harvest i mean you know more broad beans than you can hope to eat really uh, just from 18 plants so you might scale that down to 12 plants or something like that. We sometimes do, we don't always do, but I've got it in here as a reminder, peas on the windowsill and uh, they look nice and you snip them off and just pop them in a stir fry or something like that. To my taste, they're nothing like um, peas, pea shoots that you might harvest in sort of late spring or early summer, um, which are super sweet. Uh, obviously, because we're moving into sort of autumn and winter, they're not super sweet, um, but they've got a little tiny bit of a pea taste to them and they fill out, as I said, a, a stir fry or something. So you can consider that. More green garlic and then spinach. Now, I've got, I've got loads of spinach in the ground and the way that I generally do it is I put my spinach into my pepper beds. I take a pepper bed out each week. I've got five pepper beds. Uh, this year so I'm taking one pepper bed out each week over a five week period and planting one tray of spinach in its place and that gives me a nice kind of build up in the volume of spinach so just as growth rates start to drop a little bit I'm getting a bit more spinach then as they drop a bit more I'm getting a bit more spinach and then as they drop a bit more I'm getting a bit more spinach so by the time I get into winter I've probably got four batches of spinach growing for, for um, beds of spinach growing. And that is what kind of what I need in the middle of winter. And then as I come into February, as I said before, I've got, I've got too many. So four is like way too much. So I'll start removing those beds really quickly uh, and replanting them with something else. And the sorts of things that I'll be replanting with, with will be, you know, salads and Asian greens and things like that. What I do like to do is kind of fairly late sowing of red kitten, which is my favoured spinach for spring, but it's not my favoured for over winter. And so this one is coming in just as I'm taking those overwintered giant winters out. That's the variety giant winter. Then I'm popping in uh, these these red kittens uh, or those red, these red kittens are just starting to be ready for harvest. So. I've got down here actually ready for harvest in late May. That's rubbish. Uh, I need to correct that. In fact, I'll just do it now because it's really annoying when I see problems like this. Um, they'll probably be ready 
March time and it'll be probably early, Mar early March, I should think. Um, so yeah, there we go. Now, field beans. So field beans are an interesting crop. So a lot of people are familiar with snipping the tops off your broad beans in spring to stop the black fly and then eating those. And people say, well, it's a nice spinach substitute. But you're doing that when the broad beans are this sort of height, right? With field beans, my trick is that you do it when the plants are about this big. So you snip the growing tip out just with your fingers or scissors or whatever you want to do. Um, and so you snip that growing tip off and it throws another growing tip up and then you snip that one off and then it throws another one up and you snip that one off and yeah, carry on like that. It's quite incredible really that the plants can cope with you constantly pinching out the growing tips. It probably takes them about th two or three weeks to recover and throw another growing tip up. So you need quite a, a number of plants in there. But of course, they're completely hardy over winter. I mean, you, they go down to like probably minus eight wind chill or something like that with no damage at all. And they'll survive worse than that and kind of recover. Um, but if you want to keep the quality good, and it gets below about minus eight, you might just throw a bit of fleece over them or something like that just for the few nights. I mean, we hardly ever get it that cold, to be honest here, so we don't do that. So what's the idea here is that we clear a bed, something like squash, for example, at this time of year. And so we'll mulch that. Um, and as part of the mulching process, we'll put field beans in. So we'll throw, scatter the field beans over the bed uh, and they'll Put the mulch on top so an inch inch and a half of mulch on top and grow through the mulch and as soon as we see you know a decent plant with quite a few leaves and a couple of growing tips we'll pinch one of those growing tips out we'll leave the other one to grow on for a few weeks then we'll pinch another growing tip out the rate at which you can pinch them out is obviously much higher in late autumn than it is in midwinter and then it really picks up come sort of mid-February time and into spring. And it's so fast, really, by the time you get into March and early April, that you probably won't be able to keep up with them. Uh, we, you know, we can't, so we start taking some plants out. But um, the nice thing about this is they're putting nitrogen into the ground and they'll keep putting nitrogen into the ground until they start to flower. At that point, they start taking nitrogen out of the ground again and using that nitrogen in the flowering process and to make new beans. By the time they've made new beans, all that nitrogen that they put into the ground has been taken out of the ground in order to grow the beans. But if you do, if you take the plants out before they start to flower or just when they're starting to flower, then you're leaving the nitrogen in. So that's great for a following on crop like um, squash or like um, brassicas or something like that, something that's a real lover of nitrogen. So we really like field beans. Part of the reason we like them is because they are uh, lower in oxalic acid than spinach and they just make a nice complement to spinach. So you just want to eat spinach all the time. So field beans and spinach go together really nicely. You can use them almost interchangeably in recipes and things like that. And they're just a really lovely crop. And I say, because they're fully hardy outside, they keep growing even when spinach isn't growing. And they're putting nitrogen in the soil and spinach is just taking nitrogen out of the soil. So you can't really lose. This year, I'm doing an experiment and I'm going to put some of the field beans in a coal frame and most of them outside. That's not because of hardiness. It's to try and accelerate the growth in midwinter. And I think it's going to work, but we'll see. So that's field beans. And then elephant garlic. I've actually already put my elephant garlic in because uh, I took the strawberries out and I wanted to put something in as part of that process. So I just put my elephant garlic in uh, and they're all under wood chip and they'll push through that wood chip under some trees and they should look really lovely. Uh, you can use elephant garlic as a leek substitute. We do that. You just pull the stems out and use the stems just like you would a leek. And then next year they'll just grow back again. Uh, so you kind of treat them like a perennial leek, or you can, of course, harvest the uh, bulbs and cloves. Put your garlic in as well, uh, sort of middle of October. It's kind of perfect time to put in garlic in, but you can go all the way through November as well. Um, 
and then we're back to another succession of calabrese as i said it's useful for these overwintered brassicas just to do a few successions partly because of this risk of stress and going to seed but also because uh, you want to eat them in succession you know or i do i like eating calabrese fresh so every few weeks i want to say just a few calabrese and then i'll harvest them for a few weeks and then the next batch will be ready and then the next batch so i'm going to do the same with the brussels sprouts and I'm going to do the same with the cauliflower. So now we come to carrots. Now, carrots are an interesting crop. Um, our favourite crop, probably. I love growing carrots. I've got thousands of carrots in the ground. I leave my carrots in the ground. What I do is about sort of late November, December time, by the time carrot fly is definitely gone, I'll take the nets off them, I'll cut the tops off them, leave maybe about that much green, and then they regrow with lovely fresh new green growth and that just helps them stay super fresh in the ground of course they've sweetened up because of the frost and yeah i absolutely love them um, and so i harvest them from the ground but by about april time early april to mid april i either need the ground for something else or the carrots might be going to seed so Normally it's that I need the ground for something else. So what I sometimes do, often do, is I harvest any that I've got left, put them into compost and just harvest them from compost. And that just lets, gives me another few weeks. Uh, so by the beginning of May, I need something else. I need a new crop of carrots. And the only way I know to get a good crop of reliable, a reliable crop of carrots in the beginning of May is to start them in middle of October or the beginning of November. It's worth doing two successions because again, there is a risk when you're growing things over winter that it might go to seed. So two different sowings, a couple of different varieties if you can do it. I'm doing Napoli and Marion, I think, this year. Uh, both varieties that are kind of optimised for overwintering. I hardly, I think I had about five to ten percent went to seed this year and that is an acceptable loss for me they're completely inedible when they go to seed so they're not like onions and brassicas and things like that that are fine when they go to seed they're more like spinach and lettuce when they go to seed you know absolutely horrible but um yeah so if you see them going to seed just pull them out throw them away uh, but anyway that's a, an acceptable loss for me so I will germinate this batch, the mid-October sowing, in the polytunnel in a big container and they won't really grow very much. They'll get about this big uh, and then they'll just stay that size all the way through winter until middle of February time, they'll start growing again and they'll really start romping away when we get into March. So you're getting a little bit of an advantage because you know if you started you see your carrot seeds in February of course they'd be that big in February uh, rather than that big and that represents sort of three weeks of growth three or four weeks of growth at that time of year so you're getting them about three or four weeks earlier and since we eat carrots every day that three or four weeks is really useful if you run, otherwise would have run out of carrots so that is October. I hope you kind of keep up with that. Right, I'm going to interrupt this video here because I realised it for, it's 40 minutes long. So I'm going to split it into two parts. So the bit you've just seen should cover up until uh, the end of October. And then the next part, part two, which will come tomorrow, that will cover what I'm going to do in November and the sneak peek of what I'm going to do in December. So I hope you like this quick video. My name is Steve. This is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Allotment Channel and I'll see you soon.